Yeah, definitely interrupt. Um, just ask questions. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, so yes, yeah, this week, I think you guys already got an announcement, but we will be talking about 3D instead of self-supervised, and then self-supervised will be moved to next week. Uh, cool. If you have any questions at any point, just like interrupt me, uh, and I'll be more than happy to answer them. Yeah, so we'll talk about going to three dimensions. Uh, so first, going 3D, kind of like we've talked a lot about 2D, like the entire deco was talking about 2D computer vision, and that's cool. And it makes a lot of sense. It's like the way our eyes also see is also two-dimensional, and we just kind of guess the 3D structure based on like our stereo vision and just like what you know about objects. And so sometimes because of that, you can draw like 2D images like this one by MC Asher, and it will kind of mess with your mind because you're just guessing at the 3D structure, but it doesn't make sense because it's a flat 2D image. And so the reason we need to go to three dimensions, we need to kind of extend is to prevent this. We need to add uh, a constraint on structure, structure that makes sense. Uh, the reason we need to do this is because our entire world is in three dimensions. So pretty much there's unlimited applications of three dimensions from the metaverse stuff, self-driving, when you're taking cars in 3D, if you want to drive around them, you need to know a three-dimensional position of those cars. Uh, shape optimization, virtual environments, avatar generation, so on, so on, so on. So there is limitless applications for three dimensions, and that's why I like it so much. Yeah. So a little graphics primary, uh, how to 3D. <laughs> just like, how do you actually represent 3D data? Because like, we can just use images. And so one example would be 2.5D. So instead of just storing the pixels, we also store the depth, kind of like how far away the object is. Uh, point clouds, which is pretty easy. You just have like a set of 3D points in space, and that becomes a 3D representation. Uh, and then if you connect those points with like edges and faces, then it becomes a mesh. And so those are kind of used in all video games. You've definitely seen meshes before. Um, another approach would be voxel edge, voxel grids, which would be like the image equivalent of 3D. And then lastly, we'll also talk about radiance fields. And so given those kind of structures, one thing we want to know is how do we visualize it? How do we render them? How do we see it? Uh, and so that brings us to like, what is an image and what is a camera? And so one common model that is like commonly used to teach this is the pinhole camera model. And so the pinhole camera model assumes that light is a ray uh, and it there's like light everywhere. It goes in all directions. And to actually capture an image, what a camera needs to do is it needs to filter out the rays such that one point in space corresponds to one point in an image and then we create a sharp image of it. Um, so as you can see on top, if you take like, the top of the tree, it emanates light in all directions, all over the barrier. And if we just try to image the barrier, we'll get like just a blur. We won't see anything. So we use a pinhole, a tiny hole in the barrier to filter out light rays. And then on the film, we can get an actual image. So that's kind of the basics of how imaging works and approximately how our eyes work as well. Uh, and this is important because this drives us to a kind of a model that we use for rendering 3D objects in space, uh, in simulation. So how do we do it? Trying to simulate all of the light rays would be invisible. There's infinite light rays in all directions. It would be incredibly expensive and inefficient and just impossible to do. So what we do is we assume all the light rays that don't make it to the camera just don't exist. Uh, and so that would be forward ray tracing. We take maybe all of the points or maybe some points in space that we try to render. We pass them through the pinhole or to the pinhole, which becomes like our camera, through the image grid, which is like the pixel grid. And that way we can calculate where each point kind of shows itself in the image. Uh, one detail that's important in simulation is that we no longer have this notion of a film. We kind of don't place it behind the barrier. We place it in front of the barrier. Uh, and the barrier, the like actual pinhole, 
is where our camera is now. So when we have the camera origin and the redirections, the pinhole becomes our camera origin, like where the camera is. And uh, we have redirections going from the camera through the image grid. Does this make sense? Wonderful. But uh, one problem with this is like, how do you know where to start the race? Your scene can be very huge. Not all points can make it to the pinhole to the camera. And so we can do the opposite of that. We can do backwards ray tracing. And so in this model, instead of going from the scene to the camera, we start at the camera, we go through the image grid through pixels, and we see where those rays intersect on the scene. Uh, <clears throat> and so this is backwards ray casting or ray tracing. Uh, and so we'll see why this is useful later. Does this still make sense? One short aside is I'll use the words ray tracing and ray casting interchangeably. There's slightly different things, but you don't need to worry about that. Uh, wonderful. So 3D data. First is 2.5D, which is uh, also known as RGBD. And basically all this is, instead of having RGB image, you add another channel, which is the depth. And this can be depth from, let's say, some plane that you define. So kind of like an orthographic projection sort of thing. Or if you're taking like an image, your phone can actually take an RGBD camera by sending out rays and like getting them back. So you know that the depth on the camera to the scene. Uh, it's kind of boring. Every single CNN that you've used so far can be just like converted to take three, uh, four input channels instead of three and work exactly the same way. So nothing interesting here. We'll move on to point clouds. Point clouds are cool. Uh, so if you ever like, if you're at all familiar with sensors like LiDAR or radar, they output point clouds. So what they do is they send out a bunch of rays in all directions uh, and they get them back and they measure the distance. And then knowing the direction in which they send the ray and the kind of distance the ray traveled, they know where that point is in space. And they take all of these samples and they can reconstruct kind of a lot of points, a point cloud. Uh, so this is cool. It kind of gives us a general idea of where stuff, where the surface is, but it's still sparse. Like we don't actually know what's in between of those points. Uh, and so to actually reconstruct the surface, we need to make some assumptions. And the assumption we typically make is our uh, point cloud is dense enough to the point where we can just linearly connect them and create a mesh. Uh, so this is how it works. It's kind of similar to your typical like function interpo interpolation that we learned just like connected with lines uh, and then connect those lines with triangles in equal mesh. Uh, does this make sense? Perfect. Yeah. So yeah, so you cannot quite do it randomly. You have to pick points that are uh, close to each other. And there's, there is algorithms for triangulation. For example, Deloney triangulation. Uh, make sure you, uh, it's kind of like one of the best triangulation algorithms. It uh, cleverly picks sets of points to make triangles between them. Uh, yeah. Uh, oftentimes, you'll create the mesh by hand in like Blender or something or after desk, and you'll use it that way. But you can also go from point clouds to meshes. Some properties of meshes uh, is that, well, first of all, it's a graph, right? You have points, they're connected by edges, and between those edges, you have places, uh, kind of just like an extension of a graph in 3D space. Uh, Storage wise, it's all in squared usually, and that's because like the surface of an object is in two dimensions, so it's uh, n squared storage. But it of course depends on like specifically the object you have, how simple or complicated it is, and so on. Uh, one thing is that meshes work well for smooth surfaces, but if your surface has a lot of like peaks and valleys and it's like very rugged and high frequency, those typically would not be represented well by meshes. You would need to up the resolution a lot. And therefore, the storage consumption of your mesh. Uh, 
Uh, one more thing is that they're generally difficult to work with in machine learning settings uh, because we don't have the best techniques to work with uh, kind of graphs uh, at the moment. So typically other representations can be beneficial uh, depending on what we need. Does this make sense? Wonderful. Um, one the other side is like, how do we add color to meshes? And so if you're familiar with kind of like the globe projection, right? You've all seen like a map of a globe. The common problem is like, how do we actually draw it? Do we draw it as like a circle, but then like some parts get distorted and so on. Um, and so this problem cannot like be perfectly solved, but the way we typically do it is we take the polygons on the, the surface and we unwrap them and we warp them to like a flat 2D image. Uh, and so here we have a mapping between like every single polygon in an image to a polygon in a mesh. Uh, and so when we color the mesh, we see where it intersects. We take the polygon, we know where it maps on, on the UV mapped image, and we take colors from them. Uh, cool. So now we'll move on to voxels. Uh, so you're familiar with images kind of, it's a discrete 2D space and uh, you have pixels. So a pixel analog of in 3D would be a voxel or kind of just like Legos. So instead of having a 2D grid, you now have a 3D grid and it's filled with voxels instead of pixels. You can think of it as like a Rubik's cube or Legos or maybe Minecraft. It was only like monochromatic blocks on this, so just a single color. Um, does this kind of big structure make sense for them? Perfect. Um, and so one quick note is that uh, you can voxelize in a mesh. So meshes typically represent like closed volumes. So if you want to convert them to a voxel grid, you just place it on the voxel grid. And for each voxel, you can see, is it inside or is it outside of the mesh? And we can set it to either exist or not exist. Uh, and so from this, we can kind of, uh, there are like that a voxel has several properties including like color and uh, maybe uh, existence. So does it exist, which is one or zero if it doesn't exist in the voxel grid. Uh, another quick aside is the translucent voxels is how do we actually represent objects that are maybe like only sort of see-through, maybe like stained glass or jello or, uh, something like that. And so then we can derive something called density, which it would be a value between zero and one. So instead of just having a binary value for a voxel, like if it's zero or not, we have density, like kind of a 0.5 would be, we have a translucent voxel here uh, and so on. Yeah, so some properties, each voxel has a density and a color. Its storage would be n cubic. Uh, because it's a grid in 3D space. So if an image is n by n, it's just n squared. A voxel is n by n by n, so it's n cube, which uh, makes it kind of prohibitive to use voxel grids at high resolutions. Whether it's like, now we can process images at like 1024 by 1024 pixels. We can't really use voxels at 1024 by 1024 by 1024 because that's just too big, not very efficient. Uh, yeah, and one cool thing, is we can extend 2D convolutions to three dimensions. So instead of a convolutional kernel being like a 2D window that you slide, it can become a 3D window that you slide across the voxel grid. And uh, you can convert almost any CNN architecture to be a 3D CNN. Any questions about voxels? Wonderful. So now, how do we actually increase the resolution? We've talked about meshes which are we mentioned not very good for high frequency details. We mentioned voxel grids, which also square cubically with respect to like the resolution. How do we do we actually have like a representation that can uh, represent the high frequency details? And so one solution that we came up with is called the radiance field. And so radiance field is just you can think of it as a function that takes x y z coordinates and it outputs the RGB the color and Sigma is a density at that point. Uh, at that point, 
And so f is just a continuous function that exists everywhere, or maybe we can constrain it to some like space that we care about. Um, and it's sort of, you can think of it as like a continuous voxel thing. Does this representation make sense? Does everyone see this function? Wonderful. And so one thing that happens when we do this is we lose the notion of what a surface is. So previously with voxel grids, like we had a defined surface, we could intersect it. With meshes, we can easily see like there is a defined surface that we can intersect. But with this radiance field, there is no notion of a surface. There is nothing to intersect. Uh, and so this kind of raises the question of like, how do we actually render it? How do we work with it? And so the answer is we sample it. So when we cast array, instead of looking for an intersection, we sample it at different intervals. And then we use those samples uh, to create an actual image. And we'll talk more about uh, volumetric rendering a bit later. It's just good. Wonderful. Yeah, and so kind of from all of this, what is the best 3D representation? Well, it's uh, hard to say, right? We have point clouds, but they're sparse. We don't know what's like actually in between the points. Uh, Meshes are there, but how do we actually take advantage of the fact that we have edges and triangles? Uh, and then voxels are great, but they're kind of over parameterizing, they're in cubic. Uh, they have stuff inside, even though we usually just care about maybe the surface that we work with. Um, and then radiance fields are great, but we can't intersect them. They're kind of, we have to sample. So there's kind of pros and cons to each one of those. And it is really important to think about the representation because, for example, if you think back to the MNIST digits, the representation matters a lot. If we set it to a one hot label versus kind of a scalar between zero and nine, it can make your task more difficult or much simpler. Uh, and so it's really important how we choose it. And there is more 3D representations that we did not talk about. Uh, you can talk about like spherical coordinates, maybe some other discretized space, maybe some combination of the two, uh, and so on, so on, so on. So I definitely encourage you guys to think more about like novel ways to represent 3D data. Any questions about 3D data and representations? I will move on to rendering now. So going back to ray casting. So we have the forward ray casting, Remember going from the scene to the camera. We have the backwards ray casting, which is going from the scene, uh, from the camera to the scene. Uh, and it kind of just approximates it because we don't have every single point going going back. Uh, yeah. So forward ray casting, we take, let's say a good example would be a point cloud. For every single point in the point cloud, we go to the camera origin, to the pinhole. Yes, you have for uh, whenever we render, we have the camera origin and we have kind of let's say directions of right. the rays we cast. Yeah. And then we can calculate kind of like where's intersect on the image like in the pixel space. Yeah. Uh, one note for backwards recasting, which is very important, is that we take whatever we see first. So when we go from the camera to the scene, whatever we intersect first is what we actually see. So for example, I'm seeing all of you guys' laptops, but I don't see what's actually on the screen because first they intersect with the backs of the laptops. Uh, yeah. Uh, and so kind of when do we use forward recasting? When do we use backward recasting? Well, so when we want to render point clouds, we want to see kind of every single point on the scene. Uh, so we have to use forward recasting. We take start array at every single point in the point cloud, and we go back to the camera and we see where the uh, where we actually want to draw the pixel for that uh, point in the point cloud. Uh, backwards recasting would fundamentally not work with this because uh, we're basically guaranteed to almost never hit any single point uh, in space just because of like slight imprecisions. <clears throat> uh, yes, does rendering point clouds make sense? Uh, and then when we want to render, for example, a mesh or a voxel grid, we do the inverse. So we start at the scene 
uh, we start with the camera, we ray trace it, and wherever we intersect first, we take the color of that location, and that becomes the color that we actually like render on the image. Uh, to do this for every ray, we can calculate ray triangle intersections, and it's uh, somewhat efficient. Uh, technically, you can also use forward ray casting, so you can take the points in the mesh, you can ray cast them, forward ray casting, but uh, we'll not talk about forward ray casting for meshes because it's uh, how do we kind of collaborate. Let's see if you know the geometry of the mesh. Yes. So if your geometry of the mesh changes, which is kind of very common in video games, uh, you can't really do those tricks when doing backwards ray castings just better. Uh, yeah. And so, so far, we talked about taking the first point, but if your objects are translucent, uh, we have to keep going. So we are cast from the camera. We see where we intersect first. If this point is translucent, we just keep going. And so now we don't just consider the color of the first point. We consider two things. We consider the density of the first point and the color of the first point, and also the density of like, the second point that we hit and the density of it, uh, and the color of it. So, and then we can do some maybe like clever uh, weighted averaging or some other uh, kind of function to combine those two points. Uh, and so on this diagram, you can see that we have we started the camera. We go through the image grid, through the frame. Uh, we hit the object, it is translucent, so we keep going. Uh, yes, so for a voxel grid, it's explicitly we have like a density. For a mesh, you can say, like for every face, you can have also a density value uh, and so on. Yeah. And then uh, you don't need to worry about why the refractive ray is like a different angle. Yeah, like you have a right? Yes. So you cannot do backwards ray casting with point clouds yeah. because you will just never hit the points because they're infinitesimal in space. Well, you can technically hit a point just because of like if you get numerically lucky right but uh yeah you can't really hit an infinitesimal point in space yeah exactly so most of the time you hit a face uh, yep yeah. and can similarly technically add like reflections so instead of if you add some reflectivity value you can like also bounce back, uh, yeah. but yes, exactly. And the pixel value can be calculated as like an average of oh, like, all the, of all the, the first point and then the point behind it. If you do like so it's it's it. yeah, okay. Uh, and so we did that, but. Now we want to go to radiance fields. Now we want to go to the continuous case uh, where we don't have a surface. And so radiance fields can be used to create maybe something like smoke. How do you intersect smoke? That's uh, impossible because it's like not really, it doesn't have a surface. It just kind of like has variable density at different points. Uh, and so this is, the answer for this is kind of ray sampling. We sample different places and we aggregate all of these samples to create one pixel logger. Uh, so ray sampling, the way it works is we have a ray that we backwards ray cast into the scene and we go all the way through the scene. And then we sample at different points on this ray uh, and we have, let's say, N samples, right? And so we take each point we pass it through the radiance field, which remember again, is just a function that takes X, Y, Z, outputs RGB, RGB and density. Uh, and so now we have, let's say, N sets of these colors and densities. How do we actually put them together into one pixel logic? And so the way, the answer for this is volumetric rendering. And we'll talk more about it uh, next lecture, but today I would like to give you guys just an overview and intuition for what it actually does. And so we have this equation, CR, which is the color at a given ray, is the summation for all of the points 
for the accumulated transmittance for that point, the beta for that point, and then the color for that point. So what does that mean? So TI is the like accumulated transmittance, which is like the inverse of the stuff in front of it. So for a given point, if you think, let's say it has a wall in it, it will have very low accumulated transmittance because it has a lot of stuff in front of it. So TI will be very low for that pixel value, so it, for the sample. So it won't have a high kind of impact on the output that you see. Beta i is just a function of density at that point. So if density at some point is very low, it's kind of like air or just smoke, it won't be very visible. If density at a given point is high, for example, if it's like a wall or just the surface of the object, then the sample will have high uh, visibility for the like high impact for the final color that we see. Does this equation make sense? Do you get the high level intuition for what each of these terms represents? Yes, if you, in the ideal case, you can take an integral over the ray, but because we are limited uh, to kind of just like limited by compute. <laughs> We're doing samples. Yes. Exactly. Uh, in the continuous case, yes, it is an integral. Uh, in the realistic case, we have to sample along the way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, typically, the number of samples is actually like relatively high. It's around like 256 point samples, uh, which does become kind of very slow when we consider like, oh, we have an image that's like a thousand pixels by a thousand pixels. And then for each pixel, we have to do 256 samples so that it does become expensive to render radiance fields. Okay, wonderful, hope this makes sense. And lastly, we'll talk a bit about differentiable rendering. So uh, pretty much everything we talked about for rendering turns out to be differentiable. Uh, but one thing you do have to keep in mind is that it's only differentiable for the stuff that we actually see. So for a mesh, the surfaces that we see, the, we have positive gradients for those, right? For voxel rendering, the voxels that are actually visible in the rendered image are going to get like have non-zero gradients. Radiance fields, uh, you guys maybe think about those, but those actually like, solve the problem a bit because we don't just, we don't have a notion of a surface. So realistically, every single point that we sample will have some impact on the final color. So it will have some output gradient. Um, yeah. And so that's about it. You don't need to know like the details of differentiable rendering, just know that it, it works. <laughs> uh, yeah. And that only the things that you see actually have gradients. Do you guys have any questions about the lecture? So is the radius built in the outside of the Yeah. It has existed for a long time. It is I mean that should be like that should be a bunch of questions right? Right. Right. It's just a few for the scene, right? It's instead of explicitly in uh, modeling it as a voxel grid or as a mesh, we say, what if we make it a function? Right. And for every x, y, z point, it has some density and it has a color. Uh, so that's all the radiance field is. Right. So, so here you can learn the function, right? Which makes yes. Fire learning, like the 40 to learn the function. So you can explicitly create a function, right? I you can. If you make a function for like a sphere, you can make it so that like inside the sphere you have density of one and then it has some color, right? Nice. Uh, so you, have to like you can do it by hand, right? Yes. In yeah, yeah, you can definitely hand engineer it. In next lecture, we'll see how to actually not hand engineer it. So we model F as a neural network, right. and it starts out as kind of just noise, and then it learns like where density is non-zero, where the colors are. Uh, and we can, we'll show you how to actually like make it learnable. Yeah. Awesome. If there are no questions, uh, yeah, the lecture is done.
any announcements I should make it. Yes, so that's the GANS homework, right? The Transformers homework will be pushed back one week. Yes, not the GANS. Awesome. Thank you guys for coming and for watching. Till Thursday.